Well, it's difficult to escape the knowledge that another holiday season is winding down. Now, purists will, will point out that we're only halfway through the 12 days of Christmas and we mustn't take down our tree until those 12 days are counted. <laughs> so, notwithstanding helping taking down the decorations later. <laughs> and of course, tomorrow night is the second big celebration in as many weeks. But nevertheless, this year is almost over and a new one is about to begin. Now, I used to joke that I've just learned to write 2018 on my checks and now it's 2019. But people began looking at me quizzically and asking, what's a check? I'm afraid my cultural illusions ended with Seinfeld references. It occurred to me it might make sense to talk about beginnings and endings today because of one year ending and another beginning. Of course, Tuesday won't be substantially different simply because the year ends in a 19 rather than an 18. But many folks like a marker of some sort to help them say, it's going to be different from this point on. That's how we end up with New Year's resolutions. Folks saying that it and I will be different. Usually, of course, better in some way. There's usually an upsurge in gym attendance after, after the overindulgent holidays due to resolutions by the well-meaning. Now, those who have been at the gym all year roll their eyes and wait until it's less crowded again. Or so I've heard. <laughs> Folks like a tangible marker to help designate a new, better beginning and an ending of things less positive and productive. Now, the first time I preached here in the summer of 2019, it so happened that not only was I doing a chaplaincy internship, at the time, I had been asked to speak about Krista Tippett's interview with Kate Braestrup about her book, Here If You Need Me, in which Braestrup reflects on her time as a chaplain to Maine forest rangers. Now, as these things happen, I'm currently doing a chaplaincy residency at Parkland. Hospitals are noted for being prominent places for both beginnings and endings. On average, there are more than 30 babies born each day at Parkland, beginning new and exciting lives, and their parents beginning new and exciting responsibilities, and grandparents gaining new opportunities for doting and gift giving. More sadly, there are endings, endings of lives, both suddenly and more expected, and endings of ways of lives, as some must learn to continue on in a different way than they have been accustomed to or have even had to imagine. Now, there's a poem entitled The Dash that's become a popular reading at funerals and memorial services. It describes how, on a person's tombstone, in between the year someone is born and the year they pass away is a dash. The poem tells us it is not those specific dates that are listed, the beginning and ending, but what happened in our lives during the dash that really matters, how we spend our lives, the lives we touch, the love we give. So while I first set out to talk about beginnings and endings, I quickly realized I would be talking mostly about what happens between those two occasions during the dash. Now, it's not just tombstones that seem to focus on the beginning and ending instead of what happens in between. I grew up going to a Methodist church in Kentucky, and each Sunday we would dutifully recite the Apostles' Creed. I remember having it memorized before I understood what all the words meant. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead seemed to make Jesus into an official at a macabre foot race to this six-year-old. Some of you who grew up in traditionally Christian churches may have had a similar experience. Years later in seminary, I realized something about the Apostles' Creed. 
it totally skips the amazing life of compassion in the teachings of Jesus, the part that we you use tend to find most fascinating. It goes directly from born of the Virgin Mary to suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The Apostles' Creed focuses on birth and death, Christmas and Good Friday, while we, as you use, focus on what happened between those two events, what we can learn from the life and teachings of perhaps the one person who may have gotten how to live most right. This point helps distinguish one of our differences. UU churches are covenantal, not creedal. We agree upon how we will treat one another, how we will live between those first and last dates. We don't agree that we will all believe the same thing. Now, some denominations or theologies don't seem to be focused on the first date, the dash, or even the last date. They're focused on what happens after the last date. Some faith traditions seem focused on what happens after we die, not Christmas, Good Friday, or even Easter, but afterwards. Are we saved? Where will we spend eternity? Now, you use tend to be less concerned about getting from here to heaven and more concerned about getting more of heaven down here by being in right relationship with those whom we share this time and place. In the words of longtime UU Andrea Lerner, our faith is not interested in saving your soul. We're here to help you unfold the awesome soul you already have. Like many of the first followers of Jesus, some you use are more apt to put it, if you believe as Jesus, you can live well, not if you believe in Jesus, you can live forever. It would be several hundred years before the contemporaneous followers of Jesus would turn their attention from living well on this earth to the creeds and doctrines fueled by the Council of Nicaea. And many of you know how that council went for the Unitarians. The vote went to the Trinitarians in the narrow belief system that followed. But we are about what happens during our lives, during the dash. We are about our relationships with those around us and the divine here and now. Now, while we're talking about what happens here and now, as contrasted with what did happen or will happen, and what we do as contrasted with what we believe, there's another juxtaposition that ties into the holidays. You sometimes hear people talk about the experiences one has during the holidays, who you hang out with, which friends and family you get to spend time with, and how these are far more valued than the gifts and presents that are given to one another. Similarly, I know of people who, rather than buy more stuff to stockpile in a rent rented storage facility out by the expressway, choose to spend that money on trips and experiences with other people. Of course, that doesn't mean someone isn't still trying to make money from those trips. When I took a break from writing this on Friday, an ad for Holiday Inn Express came across my social media. It told me that the readiest knows the best gifts aren't things, they're experiences. The implication, of course, was that you should spend your money at Holiday Inn Express while having those experiences. Oddly enough, perhaps, there's a theology that dovetails with the idea that experiences are not only more important than stuff, that they are what actually constitute reality. It's called process theology. According to process theologian John B. Cobb, process theology may refer to all forms of theology that emphasize event, occurrence, or becoming over against substance. And once you get into it, it goes beyond an emphasis. This train of thought actually proposes that reality is not made up of material substances that endure through time, but serially ordered events which are experiential in nature. 
These events have both a physical and mental aspect. All experience, human, atomic, and botanical, is important and contributes to the ongoing and interrelated process of reality. So not only are your experiences, the times you spend hanging out with old friends you care about and family you haven't seen in a while, more important than the Starbucks gift card you got from them, those experiences are what constitute reality, not the material stuff, at least according to these theologians. Now, all of this can get really confusing really fast, at least for me, so I'll just stick to the parts that I understand and am drawn to. The fact that these experiences and relationships are what are real and lasting, which ties directly into our proposition that is, it is deeds, what we do, not creeds, what we profess to believe that are important. As I've been talking about, the experiences we can do something about are happening here and now. We can choose what we do here and now. As Reverend Stevens wrote in the reading from earlier, perhaps the simplest way to access process theology is to embrace the notion that we are part of a universe of free choosers, a universe that is in the process of becoming what the participants in the universe are choosing to become. The word heretic comes from the Greek word hereticos, meaning able to choose. Our unit Universalist and Unitarian historical and theological ancestors were ridiculed and even burned at the stake for being heretics. Modern UUs are ridiculed in letters to the editor and on social media for being heretics. In this theology, we are a universe of choosers, of free choosers. Being a theology, of course, God plays a prominent role, but this God does not necessarily have some of the attributes typically associated with God. As many UUs have told others, tell me about the God you don't believe in. I probably don't believe in that one either. For instance, in process theology, God isn't all-knowing, which kind of blows a hole in that Calvinism and predestination thing that early Unitarians railed against. Because we are free to choose here and now, God doesn't know in advance what will happen. But as Reverend Stevens said, in a universe of free choosers, God can't make anyone or anything do anything, but God pulls on the heartstrings and activates deeper life-giving and love-filled longings. God is what keeps pulling the universe forward pulling it toward life and love and peace and connection. God hopes and lures and loves. The three large Abrahamic religions are, of course, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. These three monotheistic religions have as a principal tenant the belief that since God created all there is, God is omnipotent, meaning infinite in power, and eternal. Now, having a streak of the heretical myself, I don't personally be believe that God is omnipotent, infinite in power, or omniscient, all-knowing, but that doesn't mean I don't believe in, in an eternal divine entity. It just means I question some long-standing multisyllabic adjectives. I believe that God exercises relational power, not unilateral control. Another principal tenet is the idea that God is immutable, meaning never changing. I've heard people ask why an entity that is perfect would ever change. Malachi 3.6 in the Hebrew Bible declares, for I the Lord do not change, therefore you, O children of Jacob, have not perished. But a closer reading of the Hebrew Scriptures and New Testament could lead some to, que to question that assertion. Got Questions on the Internet answers this by saying, 
How then do we explain verses that seem to say that God does change his mind? Verses such as Genesis 6.6, 6, the Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. Also Exodus 32.14 proclaims, then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. These verses speak of the Lord repenting or relenting of something and seem to contradict the doctrine of God's immutability. I believe it is true that God will never die. God's eternal aspects are unaffected by actuality and that God is unchangingly good. But God is not impassable, meaning unaffected by the world. As process theology man maintains, it's an essential attribute of God to affect and be affected by things that happen in real time by real humans through God's relationship with us. So, we've circled around to relationships in real time, here and now. God is noted for creating covenants with his people. We you use are covenantal, not creedal. Deeds, not creeds, as I said. This ties into what I said earlier about New Year's resolutions. We can focus on what we've done, or more probably not done, before, or focus on that date in the future, say January 1st, when we will do all the right things and all will be well. But again, it's what happens during that dash between our former failings and future perfection that matters. And inevitably, the time to actually accomplish those things is here and now. God is hoping and luring and loving, and it is our responsibility to make the right choices, to help create heaven on earth, to work toward the beloved community. What we believe about our former failings and future perfections doesn't matter compared to what we will do here and now. Holocaust survivor and author Viktor Frankl tells us, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response, lies our growth and our freedom. I would add that is where lies our opportunity to breathe love, here and now. We can only rejoice or regret our past choices. We can only plan and contemplate future choices. It is only now when we can actually choose to not put that third Krispy Kreme donut or a cigarette to our lips only now when we can choose to get in the car and drive to the gym, only now when we can choose to be more kind and loving and compassionate to another person. I'll finish with sort of a mashup of some of the words from our readings. What this means, dear friend, if you're hearing these words, is that you still have time to say something in this world to those you pass by, those you interact with for a second, those you sleep next to, give birth to, those you love dearly. You've passed the first date and not yet reached the second date. You're in the midst of the dash here and now. So think about this long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left that can still be rearranged. To be less quick to anger and show appreciation more and love the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering that this special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read, with your life's actions to rehash? Would you be proud of the things they say about how you lived your dash? No, you won't get to speak on the day of your funeral. So speak today. 
And while you still have breath, speak love. Amen.